Welcome to the Golden Shadow. My name is Aaron Rogerson. And I'm Melissa Polizzi. Last week we explored the concept of self and the structure of becoming. Self is something that's more elusive than we tend to think. Uh, what makes up the self is not so simple. And one of the ideas we brought up was the idea of complexes, which are these building blocks of self, or perhaps the nurture component of who we are as opposed to the archetypal nature component mm. of what we are. And today we're going to dive deeper into complexes. Yeah, so let's define complexes first because it's a term that um, many, many people are probably familiar with, but maybe on just a surface level. On so. a very simplistic level. Yeah, simplistic. I would say Oedipus complex, right? <laughs> right, power complex, mm. but it's much, it's much more than that. And it's not just a... I don't know, a term to think about in a pejorative sense. So complexes, let's think about them as groupings of related images, ideas, experiences that are held together by a common emotional tone and that archetypal core. So we can think about them as our psychological landscape, as the building blocks of our psyche. Um, and when they are functional and conscious, they help us to recall upon our history and self-continuity. But when they're charged with a lot of difficult or negative um, experiences or emotion, they're often banished to the shadow and they tend to emerge through irrational, compulsive behavior and emotional reactivity. Mm. So we're getting into a nature-nurture conversation here. Yeah. And archetypes remain something that I think is a little abstract for mm. people. There's, yeah. there's sort of a simplistic notion of what archetypes refers to, but... We are alluding to a kind of universal collective structure that mm -hmm. we all seem to share mm -hmm. when we talk about archetypes. Yeah. There's some sort of um, first draft of what you are as a human being, your archetypal structure, and that draft goes into the world and it's annotated, it's added to, it's um, conditioned in different mm -hmm. ways to yeah. become who yeah. you are. And so we already have this understanding of what humans are what all living things are is that they're partly nature. Yeah. They're given a sort of blueprint mm. and then they are sort of um, altered and constructed mm. and adapted as they actually navigate through the world and complexes reflects this. Yeah. So yeah. at every core of a complex is some sort of archetypal structure yeah. or an archetype. That, yes. That complexes um, are constellated around an archetypal core mm. of some kind. And again, we don't just mean archetype as in like, this complex is constellated around the archetype of the knight. Right. It's like, it's not that simple. <laughs> it's like, we're talking about sort of a nature. Yeah. I have yeah. a nature. You have a nature. Mm -hmm. Our natures are similar because we're both human, but your nature is also different than my nature. Mm, right. So, you know, we can use this example of, you know, the popular like authority complex, like the blueprint or the innate instinctual framework for coming into contact with, you might say, like some hierarchical dynamic hmm. or interacting with people who have authority over you or learning how to embrace authority and then kind of distribute it below you is something that is just natural. Like what do kids do when they play? They just naturally form into these little groups where some of them mm -hmm. maybe rise higher. And is the play fair? Um, is some kid like a little bit of a jerk? Like all of these natural tendencies start to flow in and out of that dynamic. And no one's really teaching them that. They're discovering it because there is this innate natural tendency towards uh, kind of playing with this idea of authority. So say as a child, you um, have a lot of positive experiences with that. Your childhood is filled with these, you know, different experiences of, you know, becoming the leader at some times and uh, other times kind of stepping in line and, and being the wingman. And maybe your parents are really fair and honest with you and your authority complex is positive and it's very uh, kind of integrated into your consciousness. And so mm. there isn't a tension with it. But what right. happens if you have negative experiences with it? Right. You develop a, a negative complex yeah. of some kind. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to try and explore here. And so um, a, a metaphor that I think is useful to sort of uh, express this idea of archetype versus complex 
is that if we were going to build a house, if we're going to say like this self, let's say, is a house, mm -hmm. each of us needs a place to live. Each of us is going to construct a place to live that has a similar pattern to everyone else's place to live in the sense that we all need a place to sleep. We all need a bathroom or at least like a place to poop, right? <laughs> we all need um, some source of a warmth, you would mm -hmm. say, like the hearth is a very like yeah. archetypal mm -hmm. part of the home yeah. that is a less common nowadays. Mm -hmm. Place to cook, um, yeah. a kitchen, something yeah, like that. Kitchen. So bedroom. These things that make up your house are sort of universal. Mm. Every house needs to have things like this or it's not really a home. And so that sort of universality of that is like we all need a place to sleep. Mm -hmm. You can kind of think of that as like the archetype. So yeah. the, the archetypal home has a place to sleep, a place to poop, a place to eat, mm -hmm. and maybe a place to stay warm, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Um, but everyone's house is going to be different. And mm -hmm. if you were going to build a house, you would build it your own way. Yeah. And you would construct it differently than I would construct my house. But we'd both have a place to sleep. Mm -hmm. We'd both have a kitchen. And so the fact that we both have kitchens. It sort of implies that the archetype um, is kitchen, mm. this immaterial thing. It's like it doesn't even exist. It's almost like this potential, this ideal that's out there. Mm. And the way that we build our respective kitchens is the complex. Right. The or, manifestation yeah. of the archetype. Yeah. So there's the blueprint of the archetype, the the framework where you kind of know instinctually that these elements need to be there. But it, kind of depending on your maybe natural disposition, um, maybe depending on the landscape itself, like you're near a river, but I'm near a mountainside. Mm -hmm. So you're going to build yours a little bit different. Or maybe as I'm building mine, like I'm attacked by like a bear and I'm like, oh my God, okay, I need to like put a wall here, but you never got right, attacked by right. a bear. Your house has a moat for some reason. <laughs> right, right. Right. Mine doesn't. I don't feel like yeah. I need a moat. And the idea that like, well, all houses need moats. Mm -hmm. It's like, well... No, I yeah. think it kind of depends, but it's right. like all houses need a place to poop. It's like, yeah, pretty much. Mm. Like it's not really a house if you can't poop anywhere, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so um, this idea, these immaterial um, potentials that are present in all of us mm -hmm. are the archetypes. Yeah. And the way that our experiences and um, just where we live, mm -hmm. who we're with, um, the kind of school we go to yeah. uh, a lot of these things are by chance but those yeah. form the complexes within us yes. and that is what becomes us yes is we have a certain unique experience a unique construction a unique pyramid of complexes mm -hmm. but those are founded in something that is uh universal to all of us which yeah. are the archetypes mm -hmm. yeah so we have complexes because we have a history mm -hmm. and the, the archetypes draw that history to it like a star, like this gravitational field. It, you know, pulls the experience of playing with friends and it pulls the experience of interacting with your parents and it pulls the emotions that are connected to it and the ideas that kind of came forth through it. And all of that informs the complex and it then you relate to it. Every time you interact with an authority figure, as an example, you naturally, instinctually think back to your entire history, but it's happening so like simultaneously, like you're not like actually going step by step. The complex is a function that, as I mentioned earlier, it it connects us to that continuity of who we are. So it informs all of these dynamics and you'll move through life kind of uh, choosing your behavior or actions or um, emotions kind of flowing from you based on how the complex is are formed. Right. So I think a simple way to illustrate um, this idea of complexes is this word game that mm. um, we're getting from Yun. Yeah. Right? Word association test. So he, he created this game. Um, he was like part of some sort of like research group of individuals. And I think when he came into it, he sort of revolutionized it in a way, mm -hmm. which I think is just his tendency to do. But yeah. I think it used to be a super long list and there were people that they were working with and be like, read off 200 words. And for every word that you read to the patient, they would say a word back. What do they associate to it? You know, I say table, you say chair. And right. then you would record it down. How long did it take them to say it? Was there anything else kind of strange? 
Right. So it's not just the content of what is said. It's also maybe the way it's said, yes. how long you take to respond, yes. the emotional effect mm-hmm. when you respond. Mm-hmm. Do you seem to be lying about what mm-hmm. word mm-hmm. you're associating with? Yeah, like yeah, what yeah. comes to mind? It's like, are you actually saying what comes to mind or are you trying to avoid it? So there's all these things that could happen when you're in, in someone's presence mm-hmm. and playing this game that would, would give you more information. Uh, you listening to the podcast can't be present with us to see how we're responding to this, but you mm-hmm. can hear us talking and get an idea. But as Alyssa sort of illustrated, um, we're going to choose a bunch of words. Yeah. And neither of us have looked at this list that we've put together. It's going to be the same list for both of us. We're both going to play this game, but the list is going to be kind of a surprise because we haven't really looked at it yet. But just as an example, if I say guitar, mm-hmm. Alyssa might say... Purple. She might say purple and maybe she's a big <laughs> Prince fan and that's what she thinks of when she hears guitar is like, oh yeah, Prince, like purple rain. <laughs> and like that's, that's her response. Um, but, or maybe it's something else and, right. and who knows, maybe she's saying purple because um, she used to have a purple guitar mm-hmm. and it just reminds her of her childhood yeah. or maybe um, there's some sort of mood of like purple is kind of like this sort of dark, maybe but sensual mood. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of magical. To kind me. of magical. And like music has that kind of like a feel for Alyssa. It's like, just like, yeah, it's just like purple. Like <laughs> when I think about music, like who knows? It could be all kinds of things. It could be literally anything. Yeah. And everyone's response to, to uh, a word is going to be unique to them. Yeah. Yeah. So the word association test it was really the foundation for Jung realizing that there was something weird happening around like groups of words or gr- like ideas. And so people were having kind of typical responses and then very odd responses. And yeah. when he'd ask, well, why did you say this? They'd be like, well, it reminded me of this thing in my childhood. And I was mm. like, hmm, something's being brought up here that you wouldn't expect. And th- th- this idea that there are these related emotionally toned pieces inside of yourself that can be kind of activated mm. at uh, a drop of a hat uh, was suddenly um, revealed to him. And this principle, this idea, this theory of complexes was born from that. So let's uh, let's test ourselves. Right. So we want to try and get to a meditative state almost. Like not, we can't do that completely, obviously, but like we want to <laughs> let the unconscious speak. Mm, right. We yeah. want to try and not inhibit ourselves. We don't want to think yeah, too not, much about not, what we're saying. Not think about it too much. We don't want to like to spend time analyzing what would what would sound best to say here. Yeah. And yeah. this will part of what why this will be interesting is this will illustrate probably that like Alyssa is better at this game than I am because she is a more feeling person mm. and the unconscious speaks through her more mm. fluently than it does through me. Mm. And we've actually tried this game before. My response has been like kind of like <laughs> it's almost like it seems like I'm not actually really playing that I'm like sort of. Uh, avoiding playing in some yeah, way. Yeah, and that in and of itself is... Telling. Yes, yeah. yes. So I'm going to go first. Mm-hmm. Alyssa is going to read the words to me, and I'm going to try and just not think about it and just respond any way I can, and hopefully I'm not going to say anything that's embarrassing or inappropriate. <laughs> like just like penis for like each one or something like that. <laughs> That'd yeah. be very Freudian of yeah, you. I'm kind of sucking myself out just by <laughs> saying the word penis. Like, um, Anyways, so okay. are you ready? Do you have the words? I'm ready. Okay. Are you ready? I think so. Okay, here we go. Deep breath. Okay, here we go. One word response. Okay. Head. Foot. Green. Sky. Water. Wine. To sing. Choke. Dead. Bird. Long. Stretch. Ship. Sail. Angry. Feet. Needle. Haystack. To swim. Lake. Voyage. Ship. Blue. Sky. Lamp. Burn. To sin. Stray. Bread. Wine. Rich. Poor. Tree. Fall. To prick. Needle. Pity. Self. Yellow. Sky. Mountain. Brick. To die. Feel. New. Ship. To pray. God. Money. Green. Foolish. <laughs> King. Pamphlet. Ship. Expensive. Own. Bird. Pray. To fall. Ship. <laughs> Well, mister. Was that all of them? That was all of them. 
So you have some repeat words. I know that's the problem. It's like I kept realizing, like I'm just repeating the same words. Like, I know, but uh, like, that's... are they actually associated, or like am I just sort of associating with what I already said? And that's why this is interesting, right? It's a really weird. Like you keep seeing, saying ship. Yeah, and I don't. I don't even like know why. It's not like you ever talk about boats or. <laughs> Part <laughs> part of what I was what I was trying to refer to before is like I don't think I'm very good at this game, and I think when I'm saying ship, it's like my mind is just like bailing on the mm. word. Basically, mm. it's like what is a like null word to yeah. throw out? Yeah, and it's yeah, like yeah. well, I already said ship, so I'll say ship again. Mm, okay, um, so it came up early on, right? And then you kept using it. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, who knows? I also feel like you said haystack and I swear like I'm having like deja vu when mm -hmm. we did it last time and, mm -hmm. and there was like a hundred words last time. Yeah. I think you also said haystack a lot. Like, and, well. you, and you say needle, <laughs> you said needle a lot in this huh? one and, yeah. you, and I don't know, needle and a haystack, there's something about that. Uh, those words are salient perhaps because they're stereotypes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe they're significant in my psyche for some reason because mm -hmm. of some other association with that saying of like, like a needle in a haystack yeah. has maybe stood out to me in some way. Mm. It's hard to know. You, you also had a particularly long pause with the word foolish. Yeah. And I think what's happening there is I'm psyching myself out because mm. I, I think that word foolish actually like brought up a lot of significant thought like many thoughts yeah. because the whole concept it's, behind the fool right it's charged for you it's charged like yeah. the card the fool mm -hmm. um i've written about the fool as yeah. a concept yes. and explored it a lot yeah. it's just like idea of how to grow and learn and change it's mm -hmm. like to constantly embody foolishness mm -hmm. always step out into the unknown yeah always take a risk always um put yourself in a situation where you feel dangerous, where you feel like you don't know what's happening mm -hmm. or you're not in control. Yeah. And that's actually how you perpetually grow as a person. So like, that's like a, a charged word for right. me, but right. in a way that's not like, Oh, like my traumatic past. It's like, no, it's like, right, no, right, it's like, right. Oh, this like big concept that I like really like a lot. Right. That's like a powerful complex yeah. for you. It's, it's, it's not charged with negativity or any of that, but it's almost like, well, what word do I choose? Um, that was my response. It's kind of like, uh, I seriously found myself, not being able to find a word because I was, I felt kind of like overwhelmed with a feeling mm. instead of just like, Ooh, and then like kind of be like, uh, like, like I honestly, and like, or maybe like 10 words trying to rush in through the sure, door at the same time. Sure. And, and instead they all get stuck, mm -hmm. like not one can go through. Do you remember which one you chose? King. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe like a fool in like a King's court mm. or maybe there's something about, like I said, like growing yeah. is like the path to becoming the king is to first be the fool. Yes, yes, yes. Something like that. Yeah. I'd well, like to think that's like what it actually <laughs> is, but you know, who knows? That would, uh, that would be very poetic and beautiful, but that's actually kind of what I feel like you, the king to me, especially with like my association with the tarot is off, often relating the king to this level of maturity that yeah. allows you to feel like there is... Uh, like a responsibility gained and a long journey that's been walked yeah. and a lot of power that's been gathered to you, but it's now being used in a way that's really beneficial, not mm. just for yourself, but for the kingdom. And the fool is the beginning of that journey. Um, right. We have to kind of start out in that youthful wonder um, to be open to experience and trust and, mm -hmm. and kind of step into the challenges to become the king. So right. I'll choose to think that it was really a, a beautiful response from you. Well, thank you. Um, okay, we're going to do you now. Okay. We don't want to analyze too much more because it might psych out your responses. Yeah. You're like, no, nah, I got this. <laughs> I'll show you how it's done. Well, right. who knows? I, I remember doing it the first time and kind of found it to be sort of like, like tense but fun. Yeah. So, okay. All right, get into the right minds mindset. Okay. You ready? Mm-hmm. Head. Clarity. Green. Ball. Water. Clear. To sing. Beautiful. Dead. Puppy. Lawn. Grow. Ship. Flow. Angry. Mother. Needle. Pain. To swim. Strong. Voyage. Go. Blue. Sky. Lamp. 
Bright. To sin. Death. Bread. Food. Rich. Money. Tree. Life. To prick. Pain. Pity. Child. Yellow. Sun. Mountain. Strong. To die. Life. New. Bright. To pray. God. Money. Power. Foolish. People. Pamphlet. Information. Expensive. Car. Bird. Fly. To fall. Let go. <laughs> yeah, see, I think your responses were more deep than mine. Mm. And more telling of your experience. Mm. Hard to know, of course. Mm. But um, you said dead puppy. That was weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind it's... of strange. It brings up questions, I'm sure, <laughs> even to people who don't know you. Um. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty weird. You also said angry mother. That was actually very interesting because, mm. like, uh, of my history, I would, uh, in the typical response would be angry father. Mm-hmm. Not so much mother, but uh, there was something, I don't know, that came out in that way. So that's certainly something for me to think about. Mm -hmm. I feel like you said pain. I think I said pain like twice. Once. Yeah. Yes. I think I did say pain at least twice. Mm. Um, and <laughs> foolish. I thought it was kind of funny. I said people. Yeah, people. Well, that's telling too. Hmm. Mm. I think I also said, like, bright a couple of times. Um, you said bright with... Like... I want to say... No, you said yellow sun, mm. and you said uh, new. New was bright, mm. which is an interesting response. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a, it's a quite a... It's quite a weird thing to do. <laughs> definitely feel like it you're... Is weird. Even if you're not recording yourself, yeah. it, it's kind of like there's like something that feels like it's pushing at you because mm -hmm. you kind of like respond, respond, respond. Right. And you know that you're kind of being listened to and watched and mm -hmm. even if, especially because you're on a podcast, you're sort yeah. of performing right now and that sort of mindset of performing is uh, going to color your, mm. your thought processes. But anyways, um, clearly this illustrates, you know, um, our responses were different. Yeah. Uh, that's not really that surprising. Mm -hmm. I mean, like everyone is going to have different responses. But you could see how if you were going to play this game for a long time mm -hmm. or repeatedly and mm -hmm. you were going to get pretty like scientific about like tracking the responses and tracking the way you respond yeah. and how many words give you trouble, mm -hmm. um, you're going to start to have these clusters of, mm, I don't know what to call it. I'd say like they're little packages that demonstrate who you are and where you've been. And the way that you think, it's like mapping out your mind in some sense, which is the same as mapping out your complexes, mm -hmm. right? And so these, uh, the way that you respond, if you're going to do this, you know, thousands of times, mm -hmm. you would start to circumambulate yeah. something right. real yeah. that is happening inside of you, mm -hmm. where it might be like, um, you're clearly expressing a lot of pain towards certain concepts mm -hmm. that seem mm -hmm. to kind of be in this realm. And you could never really nail it down to be precise. Like mm. You could never say, well, I've solved it. Like that's all this is complex. I've drawn it <laughs> and that's what it looks like. And here's the different dimensions of it. It's like that would be pretty difficult to do. But still, yeah. um, you know, psychology is, is, is never going to be very precise. But you can kind of get sort of, again, the circumambulation kind of, kind of circling around something that's real that's yeah, happening inside yeah. of you. And that illustrates these complexes, right? Yes, definitely. That there are these associative dynamics inside of yourself that hold these charges and within that charge is a personal history mm -hmm. and so um from my understanding like the word association test would be partly used at least in in Jung's practice as like you know 
part of the bringing the client in. So what's going on with your dreams? Okay, let's do the word association test. He's like, you know, trying these different things and then getting an idea of where the person's really at more so than they could just explain on an intellectual level, you might say. Right, right. If you're going to ask people questions about their life experiences, you're not going to get as much information Mm -hmm. from doing it unless whoever, unless the person you're asking is really, really in touch with themselves and really is honest, like radically honest. Yeah. Usually most people are are either not going to be in touch with where they've been and Mm -hmm. what they feel Mm -hmm. and the building blocks that are them, or they might be in touch with it, but they're not going to tell you because they don't feel comfortable. And Mm -hmm. so these little games like this, and these are things that we've been exploring repeatedly on the podcast, like tarot again, Mm -hmm. it's like a a game you can play to sort of what the unconscious speak to let it express itself yeah. in a way that the ego is not going to be able to outsmart. Like the ego is not going to be able to step in during word association, hopefully. <laughs> and be like, no, 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 we're not going there. Mm. Sorry. Like, oh, you said puppy. Uh, I'm not going to say dead. Like, I'm not going to do that because we don't want to go there. It's like the ego doesn't have time to figure out what's yeah. happening. So it's being outsmarted. And that's why these these kinds of games are useful. So um, complexes can get negatively charged, right? Yes. And that's part of this, this game might um, elucidate for people mm-hmm. is that there's, um, again, you're circumambulating something going on in you, some complex in you, mm-hmm. and there seems to be a lot of negative energy around it. Yeah. There's a lot of really charged right. energy. Yeah. You are expressing a lot of feelings of pain yeah. or fear mm-hmm. or anxiety, mm-hmm. um, let's say, around your mother, yeah. perhaps. And, you know, you said angry mother. Yeah. I don't mean that's, I don't think that's evidence that like, well, you have a huge mother complex that <laughs> we really need to dive into here right now, Alyssa. But still, it's a good example. Mm-hmm. If you were going to see that pattern, that you'd have a, a negatively charged complex or a complex that has fallen into shadow or yeah. a complex that has become sort of uh, pathological or corrupted or something right, like right, that. Right, right, right. And the kind of full test, which is, you know, at least 100 words, has probably certain terms that might reinforce. So you think like uh, mother, you know, there might be like nurturance or, um, you know, caring or something like that mm. and ways that you could kind of mark uh, these patterns more so than maybe like we're seeing here with just 20 words. Um, yeah. But that would allow you to actually like really hone in on like what is the complex that's coming out. And maybe that is the mother complex and, and mm-hmm. what's there. Is there some sort of trauma, difficulty, some sort of repression that is causing this reaction? That's what kind of leads you into being able to actually work with it on a more conscious level and also to maybe help you understand why you might be experiencing some sort of issues in your life presently. You know, why have you come to therapy? Why are you seeking self-healing and development? Is is there something that's kind of off in your life? Um, and that's going to kind of take us into the next section of today's episode with neurosis. Neurosis. And neurosis is is referring to mild mental illness Mm -hmm. yeah and everyone has neuroses yeah right that's important important to understand we're not talking about like just people who are like severely severely troubled Mm -hmm. neuroses so everyone has it um and that speaks to some sort of mild mental illness Mm -hmm. and the illness sounds kind of strong yeah but you know that doesn't have to do with psychosis or hallucinations or like losing track of reality Mm -hmm. it's more like speaking to um, anxiety, mm. um, yeah. it's depression, hy- depression yeah. h- hysteria, yeah. occasionally, mm-hmm. uh, phobias, mm-hmm. um, some sort of like compulsive disorders. Yeah. Also. Compulsive disorders, um, somatic issues as well. Something mm-hmm. that's like kind of cropping up inside of you, insomnia, yeah. I would say, or like sleep related issues or like kind of like weird twitches in the body or kind of, uh, some kind of tension or pain that is chronic in nature all of this is pointing towards some something within like the somatic and psychic system that's disturbed in some way there's some sort of mild dissociation that's causing that regular harmony to be thrown off Um, and that's kind of what is happening when certain elements of a of a negative complex you might say have been charged to a degree that it's starting to disrupt Ego consciousness. Right. So the unconscious and the ego mm-hmm. can be at odds. Yeah. 
clearly. Mm-hmm. And this yeah, is definitely. not a new concept <laughs> on the podcast. Definitely. We've been talking about this a bunch. The whole idea of the shadow is expressing this. Mm-hmm. That there is a part of us that we do not want to look at, mm-hmm. but it's there nonetheless. Yeah. And the ego is trying to hide from something that mm-hmm. is actually a part of it. Um, and that neurosis is sort of describing this um, antagonistic relationship between the ego and the unconscious yeah. where they are opposing each other. Mm. They have like an attitude that's mm. not working together. Mm. Um, perhaps they're attempting to sort of run from each other mm. in a way that like can't possibly succeed. Obviously, it's like it's not as if the ego and the unconscious can actually become divided. Yeah. Um, and th- these anxieties and phobias, these neuroses are symptoms of mm. a psyche that is divided, that is not harmonious, yeah. that mm-hmm. is dissonant. Mm, yes. Um, it can be helpful to think about the the outbreak of neurosis as the activation of some probably semi-unconscious or like like particularly deep, deep unconscious complex that is starting to bubble up to the surface. And Mm. when it does, it's bringing all of that uh, constellation with it. So Mm. that painful, difficult emotion, the the feelings that come with it, the ideas that you never wanted to think about again, um, those experiences, all of that is thrown at you. And often the activation of a complex is not just like sliding in really naturally, just like, by the way, just want you to know this is going on. It's Mm -hmm. like, mm -mm -mm. it like slams into you and it's like, oh my God, you get thrown off. There's this feeling of kind of being taken outside of your, outside of yourself and over, kind of like over, over, how do I say this? You're being over, uh, written by some other code and mm-hmm. that code is like sending you off into a, a spiral. Right. So when that happens, what what's at the core there? What does that complex represent? Right. So if we can use maybe a real example, um, you're really afraid of spiders. Mm, that's true. You're afraid of spiders in a way that seems kind of alarming <laughs> yeah. to people who have not seen you this way before because mm-hmm. I would say that you're a pretty secure um confident like really Mm -hmm. in charge person a lot of the time and Mm -hmm. like a spider might appear and you suddenly kind of seem to revert into like a little girl yeah yeah um and there's there's some interactions that we've had like a while ago where i i remember trying to insist that you take care of a spider problem yourself like trying to be like come on you can do it like come on it's not not that big of a spider like just go over there and smash it and I was just sort of assuming like I could just kind of coach you to do it. Yeah. And you just start, you just like broke down crying. Yeah. Yeah. Because you didn't want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And my yeah. response was like, what? Like, yeah, I this think it is... like nearly sent me into having a panic attack. Right. Right. And that was like, <laughs> uh, there's something going on here yeah, that is yeah. not normal. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. so there's some sort of complex. Yes. You might say that yeah, you let, have. Let's talk about Alyssa Spider Complex. This, right. is, this is a good example because a lot of people do have phobias of spiders and mm-hmm. it's natural. They're disgusting and weird. And right. like, I think there's like an evolutionary, like uh, natural uh, repelling that we have from animals like certainly, that, right? Like, yeah. uh, that's not safe. That might kill you right. in some I mean, way. Most people don't find spiders to be like cute and cuddly, right? Certainly not. Yeah. But some people do. And God bless you if you do. But. <laughs> Anyways, um, I think the spider in my psyche at a very, very young age symbolized a lot of uh, kind of uh, chaos and pain and uncertainty Mm -hmm. um, from what I would say was like, you know, at times in my life when things were chaotic in in my home and you know, I didn't really know how to process it or deal with it. And that kind of like emotional energy is getting stored and you don't really have like the ego or like psychic development to be able to like sit and think it through. You know, anytime a kid is dealing with some sort of um, chaos or some sort of, you know, difficult life situation, it's like, how do they actually process it? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. I don't really have the answer for that. But I think in some ways it started to get tied to a pretty like typical image, like a spider that's like, that's scary. Like to a little kid, mm, that's a scary image. Mm -hmm. And 
from, I think like the age of like four or five, I used to have these night terrors and I would wake up in the middle of the night Mm -hmm. and I'd open my eyes and I'd see spiders and like little bugs, but I think mostly spiders, Mm -hmm. like little crawling things. Mm -hmm. And they would be crawling on my bed and I'd like see them for like a few seconds. Like I'd open my eyes and there's like these creepy crawly things and I'm like yeah. blinking my eyes like, oh my God. Mm-hmm. And uh, then eventually they disappear and I just freak out. Um, yeah. And this happened for quite a while. Mm. And I think in some ways it's kind of typical, like the mind and imagination of a child is running wild, but it always carried, I think, a sense of of maybe like in some ways connecting to whatever kind of scary emotionality I was feeling inside of myself and maybe I wasn't expressing it throughout the day or when something intense happened, you know, at home and it would burst out in this crazy way. And so that Mm. image of the spider as representing something that kind of holds um, negative emotional charge, but also is kind of connected to what I would say is like early childhood trauma, which many of us probably have, has carried with me. It's deeply embedded in the complex so Mm. now when i see a spider it isn't like oh my god like i I, i'm totally incapacitated but if i am really forced to uh go face to face with it the complex does become constellated becomes activated in Mm. me and there the little girl does come out the scared little girl who doesn't know how to deal with this and Mm. feels really freaked out and wants to just kind of run away Right. So this is, I mean, a very complex example. There's so many things going on here that you could unpack, but the, the idea that the, there is some complex you have deep within you that is associated with, um, being younger mm-hmm. and not having power, yeah. not having yeah. agency, not having control of your environment, mm-hmm. experiencing a lot of chaos mm-hmm. in your life, uh, feelings of not being safe. That's being sort of, um, contained within a sort of mythological narrative beast yeah, of yeah. some kind that is sort of a creepy crawly mm-hmm. thing and mm-hmm. this is, as opposed to like a dragon but yeah, still yeah. sort of like the same kind of concept of like a mythological container of a phenomenological experience mm-hmm. of um chaos yeah essentially yeah, yeah. and when you See, I mean, because because the whole idea that you know we, we have like wild imaginations, yeah, and if we let our imagination run wild, it can, and mm-hmm. that's I mean, people do report things like I saw a ghost, mm-hmm. and you know we can get into whether or not like ghosts are real, but like you know my position is that like there's something happening there that we shouldn't necessarily dismiss, mm-hmm. um, which is like the universal phenomenon, the mythological container that is universal of right. the ghost, of the, um the afterlife bleeding into this life, the Mm. feeling of like the ancestors sort of still being present or Mm. there being kind of a disturbance in the fabric of reality that's in the form of a humanoid. Mm. Anyway, spiders still represent that thing, Um, some sort of manifestation of this chaos and it's been constellated around um, some archetype for you, which is security or something having to do with... um, what it means to have a place in the world that is stable. Like you mm-hmm. have your footing, mm-hmm. the archetypal mm-hmm. underpinnings of whatever that is. And that's the thing with archetypes. We can't really like, you know, nail down what we were really even talking about. Yeah. Um, but seeing a spider in real life is going to uh, activate that complex. It's going to call it up into conscious awareness. Mm-hmm. And the ego is not going to... Mm-hmm know what to do and so the ego is at odds with mm-hmm. this complex yeah. and so what you get is sort of this dissociative response right yeah dissociative, as opposed definitely. to the ego being like oh okay well this is fine i will handle this like the ego is just kind of like what and it kind of like splits apart almost yeah, yeah um it has it gets thrown to the side and you experience a neurosis where mm-hmm. the unconscious and the ego are not like working together mm-hmm. they're they're not working in concert and maybe you fall into a panic attack yeah 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 I think this is also an interesting example because it shows how 
blurry and gray this is like Mm -hmm. is it a spider complex is it an inner child complex is it a family like parent complex it's like it's all of those things you know and they don't stack up into neat little rows and boxes although it can be helpful to try to identify right like okay here i do find my father complex in this relationship to it and here is like my complex around security and and all of that can be anchored within like the reaction to the spider but is it just a spider complex it's like no 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 it, right. it's a gateway into all of these other things that are interconnected there's like roots that are just flowing in all directions Certainly. and so you know as 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 an individual starts to look more deeply into their own experiences it's sometimes like be be okay kind of sitting in the grayness of it right right i mean the way that our minds work is to reduce things mm-hmm. that is mm-hmm. that is literally what the mind does mm-hmm. to make sense of reality because yeah. reality is so complex that mm-hmm. we can't possibly make sense of all the information that we're taking in so we, we naturally reduce things down to black and white if we can so this the whole notion of complex as being building blocks is true mm-hmm. but the idea that they're like neat little bricks that right. like sit side by side mm-hmm. it's like well that's that's a way it's an analogy yeah. to imagine yeah. it but there is something that is more gray as you're saying there yeah. is sort of like a higher hierarchy of complexes mm-hmm. like there are complexes nested within bigger complexes mm-hmm. that are nested within bigger complexes and um they're all interwoven and it's not like a pyramid that you're building up as far as building blocks go it's more kind of like a nexus that's going in all infinite directions and in all these ways um and that's kind of how reality actually is and that's how our minds actually are <laughs> but we reduce things down because it's useful and we can actually yeah. have a conversation about complexes if we reduce them down yeah. so the idea that is there is there such thing as a spider complex I would say that's a wrong way of thinking about it, <laughs> but is there some, is there a complex in which a spider as a mythological device is associated and can be recalled into mm-hmm. consciousness? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, but we don't know what really, really know what that means. Um, all we can do is talk about it and just like all of these topics, psychology is the most complicated thing in the world, in the universe. And it's us, which yeah. makes it even more complicated and we can't look at ourselves from the outside, so we just do the best we can. All right, and now a dream from one of our audience members. This is from a 20-year-old male, and here's the dream. I'm in a library fetching a book for an older lady dressed as a judge. A girl I know who likes to watch Judge Judy is in the dream as well. I present the red book to her. She gasps and looks through the page. She is talking to me about how the conscious and subconscious mind and how the waking world might become a dream. She said these experiences can happen to anyone or anything. Mm, Ominous. Okay, I want to start out talking about this dream with a little bit of context because the dreamer mentions that um, they fetch this book, the Red Book. And it's important to know what Red Book we're referring to because Mm. um, the dreamer submitted this with information that it's Carl Jung's Red Book, which is quite infamous at this point. It was released a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's this manuscript, this collection of his writings from a time in his life, kind of post break from Freud, where Jung was going into kind of a lot of uh, psychological hardship. You might say he was experiencing a a deep neurosis, a dark night of the soul and starting yeah. around about 1913 or so. He started doing these sort of like psychological experiments, lots of active imagination, mm-hmm. diving into the unconscious, um, really kind of pulling himself apart in all of these ways and interacting with these inner figures and confronting a lot of difficulty and pain. And he he wrote all these journals, these really... Um, immense, beautiful volumes with lots of art and uh, almost like poetry, you might say, with the way he writes. And they... It's like free association, a lot of it. Some of it, yeah, it's like, yeah. It's like really, really just like <clears throat> letting his unconscious express yeah, itself, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, the people of his estate sort of put it together maybe with some other um, 
individuals in the field and released it as the Red Book. Yeah. So the Red Book is kind of like this holy tome of, for those who are into like Jungian work as like this deep insight into Carl Jung's uh, mind. But to be clear, it's like it's not as if it's a book that Carl Jung wrote that is like coherent in the way that like other books written by scientists and yeah. psychologists are. No, no, no. It's like, not like that. It's important to understand that like this, this book was not intended to be released. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And also like a lot of people read the Red Book and, mm. and call it essentially like schizophrenic. Yeah, yeah. Carl the, like, Young the, was the insane. The writing is just like it, it's, it's as if he is having a dream yeah. on paper at certain mm. points. Yes, And yes, some yes. of the dreams are like kind of like intense and horrifying. Mm-hmm. And so it's, so that's an important context here. This book is like reading the journal of someone who is schizophrenic Mm. and brilliant. Mm. And that's why this is sort of notorious now. Yeah. Um, it's, it is very notorious because it's come out and because it's been published and people can see the kind of like full depth of, of this work in this time. But it's very important to keep in mind that all of these years that he was doing this, he was continuing his practice seeing mm-hmm. clients writing the collected works traveling um right. going to conferences and giving talks like you know he wasn't crazy right he wasn't in a padded room mm. with a straight jacket on like yeah. writing with a pencil in his mouth and mm. like this is what he came up with mm-hmm. like that's that's also an important point but this is also just it's an atypical yeah piece of work yeah i think there's even like a quote that says to the to the superficial observer it will appear like madness yeah um and i think especially as artists we can understand that right it's like you go into these periods of deep introspection and you know really are exploring these parts of yourself and your friends might think you're a little crazy well if if you want to be a serious creative and i know this is going to sound pretentious but this is you know i just think this is the truth if you try to actually get into a serious creative practice and you really want to build things that are good mm-hmm. and not just like derivative bullshit or mm-hmm. like where you're just impersonating someone else. Yeah. If you actually really want to let yourself ex- express your deep creative juices mm-hmm. and throw them out there, yeah. it's going to look incredibly strange from the outside because yeah. just the way that our society is structured not as if this is a conspiracy. I just mean that like our society is structured in a way that being creative is strange. Mm. We're mostly sort of fitting into a structure of order. Yeah. And to be really like an artist, to be really creative, you need to sort of disrupt that order in a way that most people are going to think like, you're insane. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Yeah. And even, even for you and me, I don't think that we're doing anything that insane, but I still think from the outside, most people who know us, Mm-hmm. think that our behavior is very strange yeah, very we're working on a podcast we both have our, uh, our respective solo projects mm-hmm. and we look like weirdos because we're <laughs> not doing what's normal yeah and yeah. you know that's that's okay yeah so this red book appears in the um, the dream and what the what the person did tell us is that they haven't read it yet but they've it's recently come into their awareness and they've started to kind of read about it that they know it's kind of Jung's account of the confrontation with the unconscious and he's mm-hmm. feeling kind of drawn into this idea of what it might be like to explore these deeper layers of consciousness so that's kind of the symbol of the red book for the yeah. dreamer here something that they interacted with in the conscious waking world has been pulled into the dreamscape because it's got some potency to it yeah. And, um, okay, here's another interesting thing. We have these mm. like dual feminine figures. There's an older woman who's dressed as a mm. judge. Very interesting, very archetypal. Yeah. And then they have the young girl, someone that he actually knows. But you, you're seeing like this dualistic kind of uh, youthful maiden and kind of the older wise crone right. um, as reflections of maybe an anima figure, which classically is thought of as a psychopomp or as a guide into the unconscious, as mm. a beckoning you to go deeper into yourself. Um, mm. And as he states in the beginning of the dream, I'm fetching a book for someone. And that's yeah. that older woman who's dressed as a judge and Mm -hmm. so the judge i'm immediately thinking of that archetype of just knowledge and wisdom and maturity yeah uh, represented here in that feminine dynamic with her being um, an older woman um so something that is asking kind of his psyche to 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 continue to consider what it might mean for him to maybe not develop like his own red book, but still to, to confront elements of his own unconscious. All right. I think it's interesting that she is, uh, sorry, he is fetching a book for 
the judge yeah. the older lady and mm-hmm. then he runs into the younger girl mm-hmm. but it, he hands her the book yeah yeah and so it's almost like he is um perceiving the potential this young girl has mm-hmm. in her life to mm-hmm. become something else mm-hmm. and he's he's fetching the red book for that purpose but he runs into the younger version and the younger version of the girl watches judge judy mm-hmm. so he knows that she is sort of in this like pathway to becoming something she's sort of projecting what she could be Mm. outward and he's recognizing that and that he sees the red book as some sort of um boon to help her along that path yeah in some way and so the the associations with the red book as being this sort of deep um chaotic um key to the unconscious perhaps Mm. he's presenting that to a friend to unlock her potential which is something that's more relatable right it's mm-hmm. it's a, a version of the anima that he can feel connected to yeah. um that he knows in real life and yeah. maybe they can start that journey together right versus maybe just like the older figure that's like you gotta go do this it's like mm, like mm, mm-hmm. she she kind of sets the task but yeah. the actual companion is someone that's more relatable right um, something else that I find interesting is that the young Anima figure, the friend, is, like, excited by it. She's like, wow, mm-hmm. oh, my God. She opens it up and she starts looking through it. Mm-hmm. And then she says this pretty, like, deep, profound sort of like, philosophical thing. Yeah. And it's 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 certainly something that is asking the dream ego to consider, like, um, I don't know, like, the fabric of consciousness in a way. like. Yeah she's telling him how the conscious and the subconscious mind are kind of maybe interplaying and how, you know, the conscious waking world might actually be a dream or become a dream. Like it's just, it's something that no matter what it means to the dreamer is asking you to look at like the fabric of reality or Mm -hmm. the fabric of how you uh, define what reality is and maybe consider that things might be different than uh, the most surface level perception allows you to think it is. Right. So there's a kind of a a deframing that happens he's guided by this anima figure who might be a part of himself um to a place of deframing of, of taking apart your current perspective and understanding that your perspective is not the only perspective mm. and that it can shift very easily mm. into one that is um you know perhaps uh more fantastical more chaotic mm. more beautiful mm. more ugly um as the dream world often is to us and that this can happen at any time and so it's sort of of this feeling of like you don't know as much as you think or what you perceive as being real is not necessarily real or life takes crazy turns and you have no idea when that's going to happen and so in many ways this matches the energy of the red book Mm -hmm. i would say Mm -hmm. um it seems as if the um a side of him is speaking to another side of him mm-hmm. and saying that you should open up more or maybe you are going to open up more yeah. or that um, a time of shifting your perspective perhaps to a more enlightening one mm-hmm. or a great awakening mm-hmm. um, or a great transformation yeah. is upon you. Yeah, I would certainly encourage the dreamer to mark this dream down and consider it the beginning of an interesting series and look for similar themes, maybe not necessarily the girl or the judge or the red book, but it it, it seems like a, a, a psychic beginning, right? Like, you know, things are shifting in that realm and that there might be more for you to tap into and explore. And this could be the dream kind of marking that, or at least asking you to embrace it more in the conscious attitude so that you can guide it along and really lean into the process. Do you have a question for us? Do you have a dream you'd like us to analyze? Is there a topic you'd like us to cover? We want to hear from you. Contact us through a submission form, which can be found at our Instagram page at Golden Shadow Podcast. Or if you're listening on YouTube, you can find the link in the description down below. Thanks for listening. See you later. If you find this podcast useful, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash golden shadow podcast. Thank you.